Good evening and welcome to the 51st annual Herbert H. Lehman Memorial Lecture. I'm Daniel Lemons, the president of Lehman College. Each year this lecture commemorates the birthday and the honors the legacy of our college's namesake who committed his life to public service and social justice. As a four year, a four term New York governor and a two term US Senator, Lehman strove to abolish social, social inequity, advancing reforms, he protected union membership, established unemployment insurance, and he expanded housing options for the poor. As the first director general of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, he supervised the largest international relief effort of its time. Established in 1970, past Lehman lectures have featured distinguished leaders and artists, including Ban Ki-moon, former United Nations Secretary General, Nobel laureate Jody Williams, and acclaimed author Esmeralda Santiago. This lecture has served over the years as a powerful forum to advocate on behalf of a more just, equitable, and inclusive society. So it's very fitting that this year I'll be in conversation with New York State Attorney General and Lehman alumna, Letitia James, class of 82. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you, Attorney General, to be in conversation this evening. And um, I'd like to begin with, uh, with the question about Lehman College. You're a graduate, uh, but you were born and raised in Brooklyn. So what was it that drew you to Lehman College in the Bronx? And is there anything about your Lehman experience that you still draw upon in your career? Well, first, Dr. Lemons and to the Lehman community, I thank you uh, for inviting me here. And it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be with you again this evening. I um, uh, was working in Manhattan, uh, a working class kid from a humble family. I was working at a law firm in Manhattan and uh, thought um, I wanted to be a social worker. In fact, being a social worker is my first love. Uh, and I saw a curriculum at Lehman College, which suited me. The time suited me, it suited my schedule. Uh, and Lehman College, as you know, is a college, a college that focuses on training um, working class kids uh, to go on to do great things. And so I attended Lehman College and what I remember most is the four train, the D train and walking down that hill during those cold winter nights. And what I also remember about Lehman College is the architecture, the magnificent architecture of Lehman College. It made you feel special, it made you feel noble and celebrated. And it made you feel that you were walking amongst kings and queens and people of nobility. And that uplifted me and uplifted so many others to know that we were in an institution where one could exchange ideas and one can debate the issues of the moment and one can learn from scholars and one can walk in the halls of justice uh, and one to go on and one um, in a school which uh, just allowed you to go on and do great things. Um, and so I just really thank Lehman College uh, um, for providing me this opportunity. Um, Lehman and the entire CUNY system are filled with people who were just as smart as individuals who graduated from Ivy League. In fact, I've met my fair share of individuals from Ivy League. Um, and uh, oftentimes individuals who graduate from Ivy League, there's a presumption, but it's a rebuttable presumption. Um, and the main difference is that many of us were first in our families, um, first in our families to go uh, to college. And, and it um, takes a special type of person to overcome challenges in their life. And you can't teach that uh, kind of experience um, in an Ivy League college. You learn it uh, obviously by walking down hills, from trains, from cold winter nights. 
And that's what I learned about Lima College. I love that description of the college you just gave. And I've, I've heard that often. It's, uh, it's kind of an oasis in a way, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a world unto its own that's in the city, that's in the Bronx. And uh, you walk through those gates and you are kind of in a, a different space. You are, it's a jewel in the rough. Yeah. Um, it's truly, but what it prepares you to deal with the rough and tumble world that we live in. Um, and so I thank them. I thank the teachers, the professors. Um, and when I visit Lehman College these days, um, not much has changed. Yeah, I think your description pretty much fits still. <laughs> So let me move on to another question. Uh, this is Women's History Month, and you certainly are making history as New York State's Attorney General. Uh, you've said in the past that your body of work is really about, and I'm quoting here, standing up, fighting back, and challenging power. You're not only speaking truth to power, you're holding power accountable. Where does that spirit of fearlessness come from? Is that something um, that you always had? Did that develop? Uh, where did uh, where did that powerful Letitia James come from? Uh, you know, I uh, hail from Brooklyn, um, but um, I cut my teeth in the Bronx, and I come from a very large family. Um, and um, when challenges come your way and you overcome them. Um, it builds a sense of character, um, put steel in your backbone. Um, and it gives you a sense that you can overcome whatever comes your way. And so whether or not it's running for public office uh, or whether or not it um, comes from traveling from Brooklyn to the Bronx to attend college and then working in Manhattan, it takes courage, thick skin, um, and, it, um, and it takes, um, the belief that, um, that your dream can become a reality and that you have a place in society and that you too can become, uh, the first woman of color elected citywide, the first woman elected statewide, that you too can become the chief law enforcement officer for the state of New York, uh, it comes from a sense that you can put your pedigree and your education against some of the best in the country. And in my um, you know, professional life, being fearless um, is the only way that you really can, can deli deliver justice for those who've been locked out of the sunshine for opportunity of opportunity. Um, fighting for justice and speaking truth to power and, um, and challenging the status quo, uh, particularly when you've witnessed in your own home and in your community, um, you know, humble individuals who work every day, um, but can't pay their, all their bills. Individuals who work every day and they're facing eviction, displacement. Individuals who work every day and unfortunately cannot put enough food on their table to, fill, to feed their children. And it's, um, it's individuals like that who inspire you. It's individuals like that um, who you want to champion. And it's individuals like that whose stories you want to tell. Uh, all throughout my career, I've been a check on power. Um, whether it be in the tech industry, pharmaceutical industry, dealing with the, the opioid epidemic uh, during these last four years under a previous administration that um, whose values unfortunately were inconsistent with my own. Uh, all of the individuals who, um, who believe in profit over people, it's all of those things and more I have uh, taken to heart and have decided to challenge um, and have decided um, uh, to hold accountable on behalf of um, all of the individuals who are invisible to you and I, but who serve us each and every day. 
and who deserve dignity and respect and who need to be protected by the rule of law. So what you've said leads me to something that you and I were talking about a little earlier, and I, I want to bring this back up. Uh, and that is to do with power. Uh, Robert Carroll was the Rudin lecturer at City College a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, he's the author of The Power Brokers and those uh, famous biographies of LBJ. And uh, during the course of that lecture, and this was a kind of an exchange like we're having now, he was asked, so does a politician have to be ruthless to accomplish what needs to be accomplished? And uh, so I, uh, could you respond to that? What are your thoughts about that? No, I don't think it's necessary um, in order to um, be involved and to be successful in politics, one has to be ruthless. Um, um, that term rarely comes up. One is aggressive, um, one has sharp elbows, um, one is um, confident in their position, um, one is firm, one is intentional. I don't know about ruthless because when one tends to be ruthless, uh, what goes around comes around. And what we are seeing in the world of politics these days is that ruthlessness, um, people will remember. When you step on people, they remember. And when it's their time to step on you, um, they'll be the first one to step up. No, um, I tend to kill you with kindness. Um, I tend to try to, I believe in the art of persuasion and I believe in appealing to your heart and your humanity and painting a picture of what is actually happening on the ground and trying to um, get you to be a little bit more sympathetic or empathetic about the conditions of uh, individuals who are struggling each and every day and who need uh, champions, uh, champions for justice, champions for righting wrongs, and champions who will listen and champions who believe in equality and equal justice for all. So in your um, 2018 campaign for attorney general, your closest opponent was Zephyr Cheechout. Yep. And she kind of staked out her role as the outsider, right? She was challenging you, the insider. Um, <laughs> and at least that's the way she uh, attempted to frame it. And you did an interview with New York Magazine. You said that um, there are a whole lot of individuals, this is a quote, there are a whole lot of individuals who want to tear down the system, but you want to reform it. So that was 2018. Um, as I mentioned, the IDC uh, came to an end. Uh, New York City or New York State politics has changed a bit since 2018. So what's your thinking now about reforming the system as opposed to sort of more dramatic changes? So let's talk of, um, about uh, the criminal justice system. Um, and we are in the midst of a, a pandemic. But what has laid bare during this pandemic is the systemic inequities, um, healthcare disparities, racial injustice, economic um, woes, that have befallen women disproportionately and people of color. But in the criminal justice space, um, I've, I've seen and I have been involved in a number of instances where I've witnessed police abuse, where I've heard instances of police abuse. And this was before body-worn cameras and before um, citizen journalists with their eye cameras and their phones. People of color, particularly black people, um, have known about um, mistreatment and abuse 
by police officers for a very long time. And so there's been a lot of talk in the aftermath of George Floyd and demands for defunding the police and you know, abolishing the police. And um, I come from a different viewpoint. Um, I recognize and I understand the history of policing in this country from slave code uh, to the black code, code to Jim Crow, to civil rights, um, to a war on drugs, uh, to stop and frisk, to broken windows, um, to, and now mass protest and the inability to respond to mass protest. And I understand the over-policing of communities of color. And I also know that training is really not gonna get to the bottom of it. And I recognize and I understand that. But I do know that um, during the civil rights movement, it took more than just one protest to bring about change. The civil rights movement did not, did not happen over one year or even over two years, it was a period of time. And the boycott, the Montgomery bus boycott did not last a day, it lasted an entire year. And so change takes time. Change takes time. And in the criminal justice space, a lot can be done. Yes, we can look at qualified immunity. Uh, we can look at uh, diversifying the force. We can look at leadership. Um, yes, we can look at perhaps removing all of the power in the hands of one individual, the police commissioner, when it comes to discipline. Yes, it requires more transparency and accountability. Yes, CCRB needs to have teeth. All of this and more. And so I am not one to defund the police, redirect it, reinvest it, not criminalize poverty or mental illness, remove some responsibilities from the police because they do too much. We rely upon them too much and they are poorly trained. So I don't know about defunding. I would use another term. And I don't know about tearing down the police because they have a function. But I, but I do believe that we, all of us, should look at policing, reinventing policing in our society. And everyone should be at the table and all voices need to be at the table, including individuals who have lost loved ones at the hands of police. So no, I'm not for tearing down systems. I'm for building them up, reforming them, and for re-engineering um, parts of a, a civil society. So I wondered, um, right now, all the New York munis municipal police departments have been asked to do an analysis of their policing uh, do you think that's, is that a, a helpful first step? Is that more symbol than it is reality? What, what are your thoughts on that? So my office is charged with um, working with the administration. We are analyzing a number of these um, uh, reforms um, and reports that have been submitted to the administration. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not really in a position to comment um, on the executive order. Uh, because we are reviewing a number of those recommendations going forward. And some of them um, I support. You know, I was one of the first elected officials to call for body worn cameras um, following the death uh, of er Eric Garner on Staten Island. I went to court um, when I was the public advocate um, to release the grand jury minutes because, um, you know, basically. Um, concealing the grand jury minutes I or the grand jury process, I believe is anachronistic. I believe it goes back to, um, you know, England and um, it calls out and cries out for more transparency because um, civilians need to know 
um, what happens behind closed doors. Um, and because there's just too much room for abuse by prosecutors who have a very close relationship with police. Uh, and that's why when it comes to uh, police abuse and uh, individuals who lose their lives at the hands of police, it's important that we have an independent um, prosecutor such as an attorney general um, and other states should follow. And I'm hoping that Congress passes the George Floyd bill um, so that attorney generals are in a position um, to investigate um, killings at the hands of police. Um, it's really critically important and that um, att attorney generals all across this country can engage in pattern and practice investigations. I mean, I hope that's, I hope that Congress passes this, that bill. I'm just concerned about what's happening in the Senate. Um, and un unfortunately, um, the filibuster and whether or not the votes are there. So let me shift gears a little bit. Um, in the life of an elected official, there are ups and downs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, ups and downs in public perception. At the moment, you're up in terms of uh, public perception. A recent uh, Quinnip Quinnipiac poll had you as the highest job approval of any elected official in New York, 61%. And that was full 9% more than the, the next person, which who I think was Senator Schumer. Um, and the same as President Biden, which is actually saying something because he's got a very high approval rating right now. So why do you think that right now you're resonating so strongly with New Yorkers? You know, I don't pay any attention to polls. Um, someone told me about that poll. I didn't even um, review it. Um, I don't pay much attention to polls. One day you're up, next day you're down. Um, you know, some elected officials were climbing really high or riding really high during this pandemic. And, uh, and now there's, you know, calls, you know, for them to be removed. Um, so I don't really pay much attention to polls, to be honest with you. Um, what I care more about is um, results. Um, and for me, it's, for me, um, during um, the last four years and the last two years that I have served as an attorney general um, during a period of great confusion and chaos, um, it was defending the state of New York. And I can't believe that a woman of color, a black woman was defending states' rights, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And so uh, the previous administration, the Trump administration, each and every day, um, you know, engaged in these regressive policies um, from changing regulations and the law on the air that we breathe, the water that we drink and the energy that we all consume. Um, instead of it being clean, he wanted to make all of those different aspects dirty from reproductive rights and um, using COVID-19 as an excuse to deny women reproductive health and to take away our right to choose um, uh, from uh, the Muslim ban, which literally went into effect several days after I was elected, um, to um, the separation of children at the border, uh, to public charge, which unfortunately changed the way that um, immigrants can get um, service, um, public assistance in the state to having New York designated as an anarchist state, which prevented us from, um, <laughs> preventing us, prevented us from applying for certain grants for denying us the right to, um, deduct state and local tax. And the list goes on and on and on <laughs> of all of the issues that we were focused on from the census, uh, from removing the citizenship question from the census uh, because of racial animus. And every day we went to battle and we won 85% of the cases against this administration. We stopped him right in his track to the point where he knew my name. <laughs> so I wasn't really, I'm not concerned about polls. 
it was like, okay, we've got to, we, we've got to take action against this. He rolled back this today. Let's take action. We've got to do this today. Let's file a motion. We, we have to do this today. We have to make a statement. It was, you know, the, you know, we, I've got a wonderful and an amazing team and we were continuing to do our constitutionally mandated work, but we also had to keep our eye on what was happening in Washington and how it impacted uh, the citizens of the great state of New York. And we had to stand there um, and basically use a shield and a cover over vulnerable and marginalized populations. And we did. And I would argue that New York and California, we were the bookends across this nation in defending our democracy. And um, Attorney General Becerra, who's now the secretary of HHS, he was my partner and we did a damn good job. I just had to wait every day until 12 o'clock to call him because of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, from my seat watching you and, and him as well, uh, I had to think that, yes, you're our attorney general. You represent the people of New York State. That's your job. But you must also feel this much larger responsibility right, for the, in a way, for the whole country, right? Because you really were a lot of times the bulwark against what was happening. Well, in the absence of a federal attorney general, you know, um, I would argue that the Democratic attorney generals, we were, we were a close-knit group, and we had to step in given um, the absence, um, given um, the fact that there was a void, um, and we did. And, you know, I, I can recall during the campaign, they said, oh, you know, Tish isn't qualified. You know, she didn't go to the right school. She's, she's kind of scrappy. <laughs> what we needed during the last two years was somebody scrappy. <laughs> and that's what you got, a real street fighter. And that's exactly, um, I think, um, I learned that from attending Lehman College. And I think most of your students are scrappy individuals. Um, who make things happen, um, and individuals you can be proud of, who can stand up, individuals who are often um, underestimated, but each and every time we overperform, each and every time we overperform it, we are, you know, they always count us out, but we rise to the occasion, always. And that's why I don't pay attention to polls. Um, because uh, I'm just too busy. My head is down and I've got a lot of work to do. Now I can retreat. I can focus on issues in New York State, President Biden. We've worked with President Biden to reverse all of those policies that put us in harm's way. Um, and I just truly wanna thank the Biden-Harris administration for working with our office. We're focusing on antitrust issues now. Um, you know, We're focusing on consumer issues. Uh, protecting senior citizens, making sure there's vaccine equity, um, uh, trying to settle this opioid um, litigation against Purdue, the Sackler family and manufacturers and distributors, um, and uh, just protecting the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. So I want to come back to something that you mentioned earlier, um, police response to demonstrators. Um, in January, this January, 2021, you filed a federal lawsuit in Manhattan against the NYPD, Mayor de Blasio, and uh, Police Commissioner de Maché, seeking an injunctive relief, injunctive relief um, and a federal monitor to oversee the department's future mass demonstration responses. So this is the first time, I think, in history that a state attorney general has sued the police department. Tell us how you and your staff decided to do that and what's been the reaction that you've gotten in the community from the police department and what's the status of that lawsuit? So I worked under um, a previous attorney general, Elliot Spitzer, when we investigated the NYPD for stop and frisk. It was not litigation, but we issued a report and um, we entered into um, a settlement with uh, NYPD um, with respect to that practice. Um, and that practice has been significantly reformed as a result of um, our investigation, uh, our findings, as well as um, um, litigation that was filed by others. Uh, and, 
And, um, you know, it's impossible to deny um, uh, that um, NYPD uh, unfortunately mishandled and is poorly trained when it comes to dealing with mass protest. And there's no, there's no denying it, there's no dispute. It's been confirmed by their own Department of Investigation, Corporation Council, and now an Inspector General. All of them have confirmed what we know is true. Uh, they were poorly trained and ill-prepared to deal with mass protests dating back to the Republican convention in New York, as well as Occupy Wall Street. And we all witnessed it. We witnessed um, them engaging in a technique known as kettling, where they basically contain protesters um, and do not allow them to exit um, and then engage in a mass arrest. Um, uh, during the period um, where individuals had to be home by a certain time, um, uh, they unfortunately arrested um, essential workers who they claimed wa were um, not subject um, to the curfew. Um, they arrested um, legal observers um, and based on an executive order issued by the mayor of the city of New York, they too were exempt from the curfew, um, but they were arrested nonetheless. Um, we saw them use pepper spray. We saw them use their batons. Uh, we saw them use their vehicles. Um, we saw individuals engage in um, conduct um, that was not appropriate and not um, professional and certainly not respectful. Um, nothing exhibiting the CPR um, that they market. Um, so um, we had to file um, litigation um, against all of these individuals because under the doctrine known as parents patriot, we are um, chief law enforcement officer. Um, and as um, parents, if you will, um, um, over New York City residents, caretakers over New York City resident, the law, um, common law gives us the ability to file these um, lawsuits uh, whenever there is a violation of the first and the 14th amendment. And we are currently in court. We are seeking a, a monitor, uh, not a federal monitor, but a monitor um, uh, to basically work with, to devise um, practices and procedures on dealing with mass protest. Um, and as you know, we held hearings over a three day period where we heard from 100 protesters who came forward um, with video, with evidence and with oral testimony. Um, and they described their conditions. They, um, um, they told us about the blatant use of excessive force, um, including the indiscriminate and unjustified and repeated use of uh, batons and pepper spray, pepper spray as I mentioned. Um, um, uh, uh, and, you know, it was damning. Um, the police commissioner, Dermot Shea, did testify. Um, and his testimony stood in stark contrast to that of the protesters. Um, and what we found based upon that three-day hearing, based upon a review of the evidence, both um, online as well as the evidence that was submitted to us um, by the protesters and all of the other individuals who submitted evidence who did not testify, we found that NYPD unlawfully detained and arrested legal observers and medics and other workers performing essential um, services without probable cause and in direct violation of the executive order from the mayor of the city of New York. The case is pending right now. We are in the pleading process. Um, and I wanna make myself very clear. I will um, defend the first amendment, the right to peacefully protest. Uh, and there is no room for police abuse and or excessive force in the city and or the state of New York. Um, and this is not, I am not anti-police. I've got family members and friends and I respect the police. I've been to a number of funerals of officers who have died in the line of duty. I just want to make sure that um, 
The police know that no one is above the law. And that includes the most powerful individual in this country, the president of the United States, as well as men and women of NYPD. So in, um, in an interview with uh, Bloomberg in 2020, um, you said um, 2020 is a year of several pandemics, COVID, racial reckoning, and economic downturn. And you mm -hmm. talked about healing the breach in the nation. Do you think that breach, or maybe really more accurately described as a chasm, um, do you really think that is healable? And, and if so, how do you, from, from where you sit in, as attorney general, how do you and your office work at that? So during the campaign, I talked about talking to individuals who, um, who um, are of a different political perspective, a different orientation. Um, and it's important that elected officials um, and others listen, listen to people who with different perspectives. The most important function of a, an elected official, I believe, is to listen and to be respectful and to extend a hand and to try to appeal to their huma humanity and try to find common ground. And so I can recall when I traveled upstate um, and individuals upstate opposed my position with regards to the census. And individuals upstate said, Tish, why are you you know, fighting Trump over this citizen, over the census issue. Immigrants should not be counted in the census. And so I said, oh, that's, you know, okay, I got it. And I said, Mr. Executive, Mr. Mayor, Mr. County Leader, I said, you got a deficit, don't you? He said, yeah. And I said, and you need more revenue, don't you? Yeah, Tish, you're right need more rent revenue, we send more taxes to Washington, then we get back. I said, you are absolutely right. And I said, but do you know that if you don't count immigrants, that it's gonna hurt you? your revenue, it's gonna hurt your budget? Because the, because the census is tied to reapportionment and it's tied to how much money we get back? I didn't know that, Tish. And then I showed him where it said that, gave them some information to read. And I said, you may not like immigrants. You may not want to count them, but you need them right now. And they were like, hmm. And they said, oh, and they said, and I said, and they said, ah. And I said, I don't, I'm not, you know, calling you to, you know, welcome them, but you got to count them because right now you're in the red. And they rely upon your services and you need money. So if we can agree on one thing is we both need money. He shook my hand and walked away. He said, yeah, I need money. Another story. I was, went to a club in Queens and an elected official in Queens um, attempted to um, warn me. She said, Tish, you're walking into this club and there are two individuals in here who constantly use the n-word they're racist and i don't think they're gonna like you and i said well thank you for warning me so i walked in and the individual used the n-word he said i'm not gonna vote for you because you because i'm the n person and i said okay and i said well i no, i understand that i appreciate that and i talked about my heritage and I talked about my great grandmother who happens to be white. And I talked about how the, what he wanted and what I wanted was clean streets, and good schools. We want, all wanted to live together and that believe it or not, we are all part of one human family given my heritage. And I said, you know what? If you want clean schools and I want clean schools, I guarantee I'm gonna fight for them. 
And then I just went on on my spiel about how I'm going to fight for this and fight for the underdog and fight for working people and whatever. By the end of the day, he called me Miss James. And he hugged me. Wow. So um, uh, we've got to appeal to individuals who are different. We've got to find their humanity and you may have to meet them in the middle. And sometimes you may have to have conversations that are very, very uncomfortable. And that can be hurtful. But at the end of the day, um, you've got to understand that we're all in this together. And that a country divided, a house divided, cannot stand. And at the end of the day, I, I think there are more individuals who think like you and I, Mr. President, than there are those who want to separate us and divide us. And so you and I've got to stand up together against hate and stand with the Asian American community and the API community with no space between us. We've got to stand with our Jewish community against anti-Semitism and against the LGBT community and let people know that love is love, period, that love is love. And that we've got to let them know that immigrants are not stealing your jobs. And that all of us too should work together um, to make sure that people are paying their fair share of taxes. And we've got to talk about the labor movement, just like uh, President you know, Lehman embraced the labor movement and how it's inextricably tied to the middle class and how the reason why you got a weekend off and the reason why we've got labor laws and the reason why we have all of these protections is because of the labor movement. And that's what we've got to educate. And so you've got a responsibility because as the president of a major college, um, you've got minds to mold. And you've got to, and, you, and just like you did with my mind, you got to put them on a path of um, changing minds and educating others. I love that answer. So great. So I gotta, gotta ask you, um, this is kind of a question about you and, and how you function. Um, <laughs> because you, you've already mentioned so many uh, investigations and cases that you have or are pursuing. Um, and uh, you're working on multiple fronts all the time. Yeah. So uh, tell me, you know, to me that looks almost unbelievable. And I, 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 I think this many times when I look at what you're doing and your office is doing, like how in the world are you staying on top of all that? So what's your multitasking secret? It's not me. I get all the credit, but I've got 1,800 wonderful professionals who work in this amazing office. We have 16 offices from the Canadian border all the way to Suffolk County. And all of them, uh, like me, put their head down every day and go to work to serve New Yorkers. Uh, standing up against hate, dealing with COVID-19, labor protections, um, consumer protections, um, reproductive rights, antitrust, uh, civil rights against dis housing discrimination, employment discrimination, protecting the disabled, um, going after um, uh, elected officials who engage in wrongdoing, various different types of investigation, ensuring public integrity, uh, uh, focusing again, on environmental issues, on environmental justice issues, on climate change, recognizing the science and that climate change is real, embracing the green economy, divesting from fossil fuels. Right now we're focusing on decommissioning uh, nuclear plants. 1800 amazing, amazing professionals who don't get enough credit, defending the law, defending the state. 
implementing executive orders. All of the state agencies and making sure that state agencies I, I follow the law. Um, trying to protect small businesses, but providing guidance to small businesses as well. Letting people know that your stimulus checks are not subject to garnishment. That's what we do. We do this every day and we love it. And, and, and every day is different. Every day is different. Vaccine distribution, making sure it's equitable and fair, economic support, standing up for women, equal pay for equal work. All of the women out there, let me hear you roar. I, we just do it. <laughs> we, I have a checklist that I go down. I check with people. I make sure that everybody's okay. We are an 1800 family and we do a great job of gold star standard, the envy of every attorney general in this, in this nation. Um, so it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. I don't, don't give me the credit. <laughs> it's uh, this amazing office that I happen to represent. Well, all those 1800 folks and you do a great job at that must be a really impressive checklist. <laughs> <laughs> so um we're gonna go to q a in a minute here but the, there was one final thing i wanted to to get in with you and that is just to come back to lehman students like you alums who are watching this event this evening um and your colleagues but what advice would you have for them um who are your mentors your role models um you know what should they pay attention to? So my mom was um, my mentor. She worked every day. Um, she always had a smile on her face, always had an open door. Um, and um, Barbara Jordan, Barbara Jordan, um, a Congress member representing Texas, who uh, sat on the, the Judiciary Committee. Um, Overseeing the overseeing the um, impeachment process in, of R Richard Nixon, where she said that she would not be silent in the face of an individual who was subverting the Constitution. Uh, how history tends to repeat itself. Um, Shirley Chisholm, um, who said if they don't um, provide it, um, a, they don't invite you to a table or. A, give you a chair at the, at the table, bring your own, bring a folding chair. And I've taken a step for, for a step further. I've created my own table and invited um, all of those who have been excluded from that table to my, to my table. Um, and they can bring as many chairs as they want. In order to have a full functioning democracy, every voice, all voices must be heard. Uh, that's my philosophy. And my philosophy is um, the name of a book, Simple Justice. And it's a book that I read um, and which inspired me to attend Howard University School of Law, which was the laboratory for the civil rights movement. And I wanted to be associated with a school that took on state sanctioned segregation and brought it to its knees. Um, a school where a group of uh, African-American attorneys decided to a challenge the status quo. And they took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And so those are my models. Thurgood Marshall, who recognized that the law is both the sword and shield, and that uh, as an attorney, I am a social engineer, part social worker, part lawyer. And those were my two loves. And that's why I attended Lehman for social work and for Howard University, for the rule of law, it was a great marriage. And it turned out a great child. So let me follow up. Uh, now we're going into Q&A. We'll, we'll take some questions from uh, some of those that are in attendance tonight. And this is, I think, a good follow-up question. What was the most impactful course or courses at Lehman uh, for you? Uh, and what was that course about? And, and how did it... Uh, change you or, or give you uh, something that you carried forward? 
Oh my goodness. That was so many years ago, <laughs> but I remember sociology for some reason. Um, and I remember the conversation in the class about um, uh, my childhood. And I can remember going around the room and the professor asking everyone just to talk about who they were and their, and, um, their background. And I can remember, remember saying, wow, um, you know, the world is more than just, uh, you know, you know, my little block. Um, and that Lehman College really represented the world because they were Asians, they were Jewish people, Germans, Caribbeans, African-Americans. It was, that classroom was sprinkled with just about everyone and their experiences were so different from mine. So it um, taught me the world and it led me down this path to appreciate the differences of others and to recognize that it was, it really is our greatest strength. Here's another question. It's a little bit related. What's your advice for individuals who wish to pursue a career in law? Uh, so, you know, a lot of people think, um, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're past these, you know, we've, we've survived the past four years. Right. Um, and that we can rest on our laurels. Oh, Biden and Harris are in, 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 in office. We, we did the same thing with Obama uh, and we sat back and then we got, you know, <laughs> we can't do that again. And so we need more individuals to attend law school. The children at the border need you. Individuals in public housing need you. Individuals who are victims of environmental justice need you. Individuals who are caught in a criminal justice system which grinds at your soul, they need you. Individuals obviously who are caught in student debt need you. And the issues go on and on and on. So if you have the, the fire in your belly, if you've got that spirit where you wanna see change, I urge you to attend law school. CUNY has a wonderful law school in Queens. Right. Um, and so I, I urge you to go to CUNY Law School. And then there's a number of other law schools, not only here in New York, but all across this nation. Apply, apply, apply. We need, we need more diversity in the legal profession. Um, and even if you don't wanna do public interests, we need more individuals in C-suites. Um, we need more professors of um, colleges. Uh, we just need more diversity period in a wide um, range of professions. And so please pursue your dream. Listen to that voice in your head. Don't listen to, as the kids say, the haters and all of those people who say you're not smart enough. You know, you're not good enough. Uh, you're just right. You're just right. You're perfect. What you just said reminded me of uh, Vernon Jordan, somebody who whose career spanned such, you know, he went from the corporate world to, to all kinds of civil cases and That's right. civil rights cases and, uh, uh, you know, kind of what you're describing. That's right. And he couldn't read. He was dyslexic. Um, there's a wonderful book out that says Verdon, Verdon cannot read. And I urge all of you to read the book, The Life and Times of Verdon Jordan. May he rest in peace. So, um, on policing, to come back to policing, uh, this is a question about uh, social workers involved in de-escalating situations. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, so I think, you know, obviously we need social workers uh, to take on some of the responsibilities of um, the police. One thing I did not talk about um, as the attorney general, and this is uh, the area um, that I work on, which I like the least, and that is investigating um, um, police involved, de involved deaths. And during these last two and a half years as the attorney general, I've had to investigate quite a few. In fact, you may have read about the case um, that I was involved in in Rochester, Daniel Prude, someone who was in the throes of mental illness, someone who was 
um, unfortunately high on PCP, running through the streets of Rochester in the in the middle of the winter, um, in the midst of a slight uh, snowstorm, naked, sweating profusely, um, and covered with blood. Um, and his brother called the Rochester police. Um, and what his brother wanted was um, uh, medical assistance for Daniel Prude. Unfortunately, he did not get that. What he got was this technique known as segmenting, where the police officers are on your back um, and um, there, there's a need to your, to your, to, um, um, you know, on, on your back and uh, um, you are prone. And um, fortunately, because he was exerting a lot of energy, um, because he had just been running and running and running. Um, and because um, the PCP elevated his heart rate um, and because that, that technique contributed obviously to his heart rate, all of those factors led to his death. Uh, we charged a grand jury in Rochester. The grand jury came back with a no true bill. They, they did not indict. Um, there were protests in Rochester. Um, but that has happened over and over again. In fact, the vast majority of the cases that we've had to investigate involved individuals who are on drugs, um, suffering from excited delirium and suffering from an, um, a, a pulse rate and they died as a result of police interaction and police mishandled them. What should have happened, um, and in the Daniel Prude case, the other factor was they put a spit hood over his head and that further, further um, aggravated um, the situation. The, most of the cases, again, the same fact pattern and the police overreact, they don't de-escalate, they don't step back, they don't allow social workers to come in and or medics. They engage in this physical alter, uh, altercation um, and they exert physical force as opposed to, again, conversation, uh, communication, lowering their voice, giving them blankets, comforting them. Well, not comforting them, um, but just appealing to them and just you know surrounding them so they don't hurt themselves. And that's just not what happens because police officers are not trained to deal with individuals who are in the throes of mental illness. And each and every time it's resulted in death. And that's the most difficult aspect of my work. And so yes, social workers need to be embedded with police. They need to be first responders and they need to deal with individuals who unfortunately are suffering from drug addiction, mental illness um, and um, excited delirium. Here's a question that um, <clears throat> a little different angle. What what would you ask of New Yorkers and to support the goals that you have? You've talked about a lot of those this evening. Right now, I need um, uh, we need to uh, look at policing in our society. Um, rethink policing, um, and I know that there is a lot of support for the police department, and I have nothing but the greatest admiration and respect for a police department. Uh, but some of their practices um, should not be, um, some of their practices need to be revisited. Um, and um, we need to re-examine their role. Um, and we need to, again, um, transfer some of the responsibilities that they currently have um, to other professionals, such as social workers. And so uh, that's what I would like um, New Yorkers uh, to assist me with. And um, most of them have been the polls and the, the aftermath of George Floyd and all of these other videos that people are now witnessing um, are pretty much um, uh, understanding and sympathetic um, to the need for change in how we uh, police our society. Um, and then um, two, I think um, we just uh, need to talk about hate a little bit more. Uh, and, um, and it's corrosive 
effects on people. And we need to be factual. Elected officials need to be factual. As the kids say, facts. And we, not, and we should not be treading in misinformation and disinformation. It does not, in order to the, um, to the benefit of our democracy and to healing the divide, the rift that currently exists, the breach that exists in our society. So <clears throat> there's a, a question here that uh, kind of a follow up on Rochester um, and what appears to be something fairly deeply amiss and, and you know, maybe a racist school district, maybe a racist police department. Um, what, what, how do you address that? How does, how do, how do you uh, uh, address some, that kind of deeply embedded racism that, you know, probably I, maybe we shouldn't single out Rochester because that's, you know, that's the case in front of us. No, we should single out Rochester. Uh, alone. <laughs> Not alone, right. For the purposes of this conversation. Yeah. And they've been in the newspaper quite a bit. Yeah. Um, a nine-year-old child was pepper sprayed. A woman with a baby was pepper sprayed. Um, someone who was suffering, another person who was suffering from mental illness died at the hands of police. And then you've got Daniel Prude. You've got a police department which is overwhelmingly white in a neighbor in a in a in a county which is um, majority black. Something is amiss in Rochester when it comes to policing, and so we need to look at training. Uh, we need to look at the police force. We need reforms, um, um, and we we and we need to be honest about it, um, and. We need to move away um, from all of this physical force and um, focus more on communication, um, uh, community policing, um, uh, and um, respect for the dignity of all of life, Black and white, Latino and Asian all together. Uh, that's what we need. So you've mentioned training. This is not a question coming from the audience. This is my question, follow up. You've mentioned training a number of times this evening. And um, I know that that frequently is put forward as one of our solutions. What do you think makes it effective? And, and I guess, you know, to be a little more specific, you know, there's there, we talk about bias, uh, uh, different kinds of bias. But what about um, the idea of, of taking it on a little more head on and just say, we need anti-racist training? What, you know, what are your thoughts about training? So, you know, we need to embrace unbi um, um, unbiased, uh, uh, conscious, con unconscious bias um, that needs to be incorporated in our training. And, you know, if you look at police departments um, internationally, NYPD only received six months of training. There are some departments in other countries where it's a year and then it's an internship where you are embedded with the police. Qualified immunity is a major issue. Unions, and I am a proud union person, but um, PBA is not interested in reform and or progress and they stand in the way of reform um, because within their collective bargaining agreement, all of these issues and more are um, part of the collective bargaining when collective bargaining historically has just been used as, you know, to negotiate wages and working conditions, but they've expanded it. So expanded training, unconscious bias, you know, yes, we need to talk about racism. Um, we need to talk about the history of racism. We need to talk about the history of policing, which is embedded in, in racism, going back to the slave trade, the slave code, black code, et cetera. Um, all of that and more. And I think um, we obviously need a force 
which is diversified and that includes women. Because right now in New York, you've got, it's primarily a majority minority department, but um, the rank and file is majority minority. But once you get past a certain um, level, it's predominantly white leadership position, captain, sergeant, all of that, um, those um, positions are predominantly held by um, white individuals. Rank and file tends to be um, people of color. But there's a, I think the number of women is single digit, a single percentage, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's less than 10%, maybe slightly more. We need more women. Uh, because with all due respect, Mr. President, we approach things differently. We govern differently. You know, in countries that are led by women, the infection rate is real low. <laughs> in countries led by women, the number of police incidents are low. In countries led by women, people live longer. Maybe there's something to this feminine mystique. <laughs> well, we're certainly glad to have you uh, as the head of our uh, attorney general's office. And, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're drawing to the end of our session got a few minutes left, just a couple. Uh, I wonder if there's anything that you would like to close with. I just want to thank you, Dr. Lemons, for this opportunity, this fireside chat. Uh, <laughs> I, it was, it, was, uh, it, uh, it was greatly needed. We touched on a lot of issues. Um, but basically, my message um, is uh, rather simple. I urge all of your students to dream big. I never set out to be a glass breaker um, or someone who uh, would, sh you know, would shatter certain history books. That, that was not my goal. It was just to represent the interest of those who had been historically ignored. And I don't um, get caught up in titles much. Um, I'm more impressed um, with uh, those who believe in sacrificing and those who recognize and understand that um, the more that you do for others, uh, that is what brings you closer to God. And that is what I try to do each and every day. So let us continue to work together to perfect, you know, more perfect union and let us continue to work together and stand together with no space between us, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, making this a more just and equal society. I thank you so much, Dr. Lemons. I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney General Letitia James. Uh, it's been wonderful to spend this time with you. I can tell you, I speak for the whole Lehman community. We could not be more proud of you as an alumna of Lehman College. Go so, Lehman! <laughs> <laughs> thank you to you. Thanks to everyone who uh, participated uh, tonight. Thanks for the questions. Uh, and I wish everyone a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>